This is the fifth podcast in my series on the Apostle Paul. And we had left Paul. He had spent three years in Damascus, probably searching in the scriptures to answer all kinds of questions. And I, I rattled off a lot of those questions that he would have had in his mind. And finally, he felt prepared to go to Jerusalem, which is where the leaders of the Christian church were. But the leaders didn't even meet with him. He, he met Peter, who was then the leader of the church. And Peter then called in James, who became the leader of the church after Peter. And Paul was presenting what he had uncovered from the Hebrew scriptures. He had to to convince them that God wanted him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Number one, to be an apostle, and then to say, he wants me to go to the Gentiles. Well, that wasn't received very well either, because this was a Jewish movement at that time. Yes, a few Gentiles were believing, but until Paul got out on the road, there, there really weren't many Gentiles that were accepting Yeshua as, as the Jewish Messiah. So Peter and James had him escorted to the port city of Caesarea on the coast of Israel, and they put him on a ship to go back to Tarsus, and Tarsus was his home in the southern part of what is today Turkey. So when Paul entered Tarsus, after a sea voyage of several days from Caesarea on the coast of Israel, he was returning in many ways to his older life. His ship would have left the Mediterranean Sea to travel up the Sidnus River to the busy commercial port of Tarsus in Asia Minor, one of Rome's great centers of trade. The wharves would have been crowded with goods and bustling with people from every corner of the empire. The Roman roads of two major trade routes intersected in Tarsus. From Babylon to the east and Antioch from the south, goods and travelers entered Tarsus before continuing their journey either by sea to Alexandria, Athens, and Rome, or overland to Macedonia and Greece. So this was a very, very busy city where people from all over the Roman Empire were coming through for the purpose of trade. And this is where Paul had been brought up in Tarsus. Paul, when he arrived in Tarsus, would have returned to his family home in the Jewish quarter of Tarsus. So the Jews gathered together and lived in one section of Tarsus. We know there was a significant Jewish presence in uh, the city. Israel had not escaped this movement of people. Paul tells us his family was from the tribe of Benjamin, so we know they came originally from the area west of Jerusalem, which was the, where the tribe of, of Benjamin was located, but the family had moved to Tarsus, probably being forced to move. The predominant livelihood of Paul's Jewish community was probably related either to the manufacture of crafts or to actual trade. Paul's father may have been a tent maker who taught the craft to his son, but that level of manual skill was not fit for a Roman citizen. And apparently, Paul's father had been made a Roman citizen. We don't know why, but he was, um, which meant Paul was also a Roman citizen. Furthermore, Paul's family had sufficient financial resources to send their son to study in Jerusalem. So Paul's father was probably not a manual laborer, as Paul later became but may have been a merchant. Maybe he was a merchant for tent-making craftsmen. Perhaps there were laborers working in a shop behind the family home. As a merchant, Paul's father would have distributed the products of his workmen from the great trade center of Tarsus. He would have been a man of prestige and responsibility in the Jewish community. If Paul had learned the craft of tent making when he was in Damascus as a way of supporting his anticipated itinerant mission to the Gentiles, he must have faced a severe dilemma when he returned to his father's house. His family would have viewed this descent to manual labor as demeaning. Hints in Paul's letters imply a negative perception of such activity from the perspective of one who had been raised to a life of comfort and status. Paul declares in his letter to the Galatians, we toil working with our hands. Oh, this was to the Corinthians. And he connects this sense of fatigue with being reviled and persecuted by others. 
Paul also experienced hard manual labor in sleeplessness in hunger. So by learning the craft of tent making, Paul was rebelling against his family, which held a position of financial well-being and prestige in the community. Every time Paul turns around, he's causing trouble that has, he has to overcome. And here's just another example of a crisis, which would have occurred with his family. However, Paul would have continued searching the scriptures after his arrival in Tarsus. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Given the recent cool reception from the Christian leaders in Jerusalem, Paul probably continued to pore over the scriptures for answers to his growing list of questions. One that we can see in the letter to the Galatians is these Gentile believers are speaking in tongues and they're doing miracles, yet they don't know the law and they haven't been circumcised. You know, what is going on? Paul was asking these questions and he must have been searching the very depth of Scripture to try to figure out what was going on. This practice of study would have been acceptable to his family and perhaps even expected after his return from Jerusalem as a student of Gamaliel. But at some point, Paul would have felt prepared and ready to start following his calling as an apostle to the Gentiles. His family may have chosen to disinherit him. We don't know whether that happened or not, but it certainly would have been a possibility when he became an itinerant teacher. We sense this cataclysmic event in his letter to the Philippians, where he says, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. He has suffered the loss of all things. Ooh, it just tugs at my heart when I read these things. And, you know, when I first read them, I just kind of glossed over them. But the more you understand Paul and the, his life and what he went through, the more it really does tug at your heart. Before we go on, let's return to Tarsus, to those early years in Paul's life. As Paul readjusted to his former life in Tarsus, he was returning to a culture that was predominantly Greek. In Tarsus, he was surrounded by temples where the Greeks worshipped their pagan gods. Now, the Romans had conquered the Greeks, but they kept the Greek gods. They kept the Greek temples. They kept a lot of the Greek practices. The market was in the central part of the city, and it had magnificent Roman colonnades, statues of gods, and mosaic images. Of course, the Jews did not believe in, in images of gods, but there they were. I mean, he was surrounded by this Greek culture that had been accepted by the Romans. In his later writings, we can see that he was familiar with the Greek theater, where plays were performed. He was familiar with the gymnasium, gymnasium, where men and boys received physical and athletic training. And he was familiar with the amphitheater that offered public entertainment. Paul uses metaphors that evoke images of Hellenistic culture. In his letter to the Corinthians, for example, he incorporates images of the popular races performed in amphitheaters throughout the Roman Empire. This is what we read in 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? That's talking about the tradition of the Greek races. That, Of course, the Romans took over that tradition. A diverse collection of ethnic people from both the Orient of the, toward the East and the West mingled in Tarsus to create a great cosmopolitan center. Walking through the streets and pathways of the city, Paul would have heard languages from every corner of the Roman Empire. In Paul's own Jewish community, the language was either Hebrew or Aramaic. It was probably Aramaic at that time, but they knew Hebrew because Hebrew was spoken in the synagogue. But... Greek, Koine Greek, was the language of trade and commerce, the one language that enabled the empire to function as a unified entity. And of course, the New Testament is written in Koine Greek, which and that could be spread throughout the entire Roman Empire and people would be able to read it. But not many people spoke Latin. That Latin was spoken by the, the rulers, the Roman rulers. However, many people in Tarsus would have been familiar with that Koine Greek. That's why Koine Greek is, is what the New Testament is written in that language. When Paul went to the synagogue, the Holy Scriptures would likely have been recited and read 
Well, now here, it, I'm, I'm suggesting that they may have been read in Greek because the Septuagint translation was a translation from Hebrew to Greek. And when the Jews were dispersed around the Roman Empire, the language that they had was, was Greek. And, and they may have lost the ability to, to do the Hebrew. Uh, we're not sure, but it's very possible. Just like we read our Bible in English today. You know, we don't read it in Hebrew or Koine Greek or Latin. Tarsus was a city of the Jewish diaspora where Jews had settled outside the land of Israel. Individual scrolls of the sacred writings had been collected about 200 years earlier in Alexandria, the largest city of the diaspora communities, and translated from Hebrew to Greek. This translation is known as the Septuagint, meaning 70, because there were 70 translators. And this Greek translation was used by Jews throughout the diaspora. Paul's later letters to the churches, which were collected and incorporated into the New Testament, exhibit his familiarity with this Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Paul's letters also exhibit a sophisticated understanding of Hellenistic literary composition. He crafted his apostles using a rich Greek vocabulary and intricate grammatical constructions that indicate a significant level of education. He had a thorough command of Greek rhetorical methods of persuasion that suggest careful instruction and perhaps also extensive scholastic practice. Betts is um, a Christian theologian, modern uh, author, who has drawn attention to this skill in his classic study of Galatians, which stimulated a branch of New Testament studies that is uncovering complex patterns of persuasive rhetorical arguments in the Pauline epistles. Paul's intricate variations in Greek epistolary composition also reach a level of skill far beyond the mere writing of letters. The Christian leaders in Jerusalem were all Jews from Judea, may even have suspected Paul of Greek sympathies. That wouldn't surprise me at all. However, Paul's letters display a high level not only of Greek education, but also of Jewish education. We can draw on literary and archaeological evidence to reconstruct the traditional education of Jewish boys. Rabbinic literature of the early 3rd century of the Common Era informs us they were ready to learn the Torah, also known as the written law, when they were five years old. This early education was by oral memory rather than reading the text, since scrolls were rare even in the synagogue. The New Testament captures this widespread educational practice in Paul's letters to Timothy. From childhood, this is what we read in 2 Timothy, from childhood you have known the sacred writings, Paul reminds Timothy. Paul also knew the written law to the extent that he could cite verses and allude to entire passages in the Hebrew scriptures. He could just do it from memory. At age 10, boys began to memorize and understand rules of behavior in the oral law, also called the tradition of the elders. One author has demonstrated Paul's knowledge of the oral law in his epistles to the Corinthians. That's an author by the name of Thompson. Paul was intimately versed in both the written law, which is the Torah, and then that also would have included the prophets and the writings, which were considered by the Pharisees, and he was a Pharisee, uh, considered by the Pharisees as commentary on the Torah. The Torah was the, the kernel, the heart of God's instruction. And Paul also would have been taught the oral law. And uh, Thompson has demonstrated Paul's knowledge of the oral law in his epistle to the Corinthians. The oral law would have been the interpretation, the midrash, the, the rulings, that were passed down orally from teacher to disciple to disciple to disciple. This was the oral law. They learned by memorization, so the oral law was learned by memorization. Paul was intimately versed in both the written law, which would have been the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, and the oral law, which was called the traditions of the elders. <laughs> 
According to rabbinic literature, a young man was sufficiently prepared to enter the family business at the age of 15. However, some would have pursued further education in the scriptures, moving beyond the commandments of the oral law to methods of penetrating scripture to discover its mysteries. The name for such an advanced school was a Beit Midrash. Beit is, is school or house, Beit Midrash, the house of Midrash, the, uh, the school for teaching Midrash. Those advanced methods of pulling out deeper meaning from scripture that had not been exposed before. The school of Gamliel in Jerusalem was undoubtedly such a Beit Midrash. Few were able to pursue this higher learning because economic circumstances generally required them to work. Those who did, including Paul, became an elite class of Jewish scholars. Our only source for Paul's attending Gamaliel's school of Midrash in Jerusalem is Luke in Acts. Paul is silent, but Paul's letters exhibit his knowledge of various Midrashic methods of searching the scriptures, which would have been part of his advanced training in a Beit Midrash. And I have uncovered numerous places in the New Testament that are using these methods of Midrash. This practice of uncovering mysteries in scripture added to the growing collection of rulings in the oral law. Scholarship has generally concluded that Paul had some kind of formal education at the level of a Beit Midrash. Paul tells us he was raised as a Pharisee, and the Beit Midrash of Gamliel was a Pharisee school. Gamliel was the grandson of the great sage Hillel. The Talmud explains that this Jewish sect drew new meaning out of the written law to answer questions that were not explained in the literal meaning. This Pharisee practice of drawing out hidden meaning was different from the Sadducees, who relied on a more literal interpretation. For example, the Torah records a dilemma. What happens if an ox falls into a pit on the Sabbath? This is no idle question. An observant Jewish farmer would obey the commandment of the Torah, which is the written law, to do no work on the Sabbath. That is, he could not remove the ox from the pit until the day following the Sabbath. But the ox would likely have been his sole work animal for farming the land and providing for his family. Would God ask him to forfeit his source of living by obeying the commandment to do no work on the Sabbath? Furthermore, what constitutes work? That's not explained in the Torah. Answers to such questions were drawn from Scripture using methods of Midrash. And these answers constituted legal rulings that were recorded in the oral law. The Pharisees considered the authority of this oral law equivalent to that of Scripture, since the rulings were derived from Scripture. Paul must have excelled in the Beit Midrash of Gamaliel. He says simply, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen. And that's in his letter to the Galatians. As for his commitment to learning the oral law, he adds, I was more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions that would have referred to the oral law. We can imagine Paul entering into vigorous debate with his peers. Paul would have been arguing from Scripture to support his interpretation and emerging the victor. He must have been brilliant. He must have supported the Jewish leaders in their opposition to the Christian belief that Jesus of Nazareth, the Galilean who was crucified by the Romans, was the promised Messiah. Luke remarks, Shaul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. Furthermore, the Jewish leaders selected Shaul to carry this persecution of the Christians to Damascus, which is where he had his encounter with Yeshua the Messiah. After three years in Damascus, Paul, a Christian believer, appeared in Jerusalem to engage in vigorous discussion with Peter and James. They were apparently unconvinced by his arguments and sent him off to Tarsus to get rid of him. But Paul responded to this new crisis in his life, as he did to continuing crises throughout his ministry, by seeking God for direction and searching the scriptures for deeper meaning. Paul was highly skilled and prepared to uncover hidden mysteries from scripture, which would answer his growing questions about Yeshua the Messiah and would direct his apostleship and calling to bring the gospel to the Gentiles.